Hi everyone. I think that just as we started this webinar, David may have frozen, so I'm going to say hello uh, whilst we wait for David to reappear. Um, welcome to this, our third uh, Corporate Partnerships um, presentation. Um, hello. Tarsten Institute of Fundraising as part of their RAISE programme. Um, hopefully David will jump on in a minute to chat more about some of the brilliant programmes they've got coming along. Um, but Ellie is taking over on the hot seat today. So Ellie, over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, shall I give people like a couple more minutes to join? Yeah, I think so. Just yes. because we are on the dot one o'clock. And David, I think is rejoining. But yeah, I am, I'm doing today's session. Um, so very excited to welcome you all. Um, if you wanna pop in the chat, uh, where you're from and say hello. Um, Rebecca's gonna be manning the chat. And I think similarly to how we've been doing it before, we'll just kind of ask questions and answer them as we go. All right, 28, people still coming in? Yeah, yeah. Couple more minutes maybe, a minute. Yeah, it's only one minute past. Yeah. Life from National Youth Choir, Elizabeth Literary, uh, Cambridge Literary Festival. Hello, hello. National Youth Choir, I might need to look into that live. My daughter loves a bit of choir. Rochester and Ipswich Museums. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Kelly from Midland Arts Centre. Uh, Holly from Exeter Phoenix. It's great. For national audience, which is brilliant. Joe yeah, from great. Sally from National Theatre Wales. Hey, Sally. Morton, Bristol. Caroline from Bristol. Hello from the Midlands, Wales. Brilliant. Loads and loads of places. Fantastic. Amazing. All right, we've got 40 on. So, um, yeah, in the interest Sweet. of time. And then maybe David can pop on, on the end and share some of the. Uh, raise info and charge yeah. info. amazing okay cool i think yeah i think we're ready to go uh okay so today's session is tips for finding prospects and building relationships with companies so hopefully you can see this um okay a little bit of the background um about me so uh my background is in drama so i studied drama at the royal central school of speech and drama uh so i have that's my degree and i did have sights on being an actor and after I graduated I kind of um, pursued that for a little bit but then did need some money so fell into sales and I worked at a company called The Future Factory. Um, they are a new business uh, consultancy so we are my main role was sales, cold emails, cold calls for creative agencies that were looking to speak to brands so I did that for a couple of years then I sort of started working um, brand side in advertising. I did that for a, um, a year or two. And then I ended up in a um, CSR agency, so um, corporate social responsibility agency that were making campaigns, but um, sort of aligning themselves with sustainability and social purpose. And then from that point, I found the job uh, at the South Bank Centre as a corporate development manager, which I hadn't even really sort of knew existed, that world where I could sort of bring in my sales background, but into like my passion, which is the arts. So I was there for two years looking after their corporate partnerships and supporting on um, the corporate membership scheme. And then at the beginning of the um, pandemic, I started working with Rebecca um, at Rosendale Partnerships. So Rebecca's probably uh, touched on this, and if, if you're new to the session, I'll just give a bit of an overview, but Rosendale Partnerships is a consultancy that supports um, arts organisations, so we broker corporate partnerships, support on corporate memberships. Um, we, are, we work on a retained basis with our clients and occasionally do commission. Um, needless to say, I'm super passionate about the arts. Uh, I think theatre will always have a very special place in my heart, but just more generally, the organisations that we work with, which I'll just give you a bit of a snapshot of some of them there, are incredible and just, you know, so interesting to work with the teams and organisations. And, and also outside of London, we're working with some organisations um, uh, up in Manchester. So really exciting that some of you on the call are sort of outside London and we've got a really nice national reach. 
So what are we going to be covering in the session today? So I've just done a, a wee intro there. Um, I think it's worthwhile us just talking very briefly on what a sponsor looks for. Again, Rebecca covered this in our first session, but for those of you who weren't able to join the call, we'll just touch on what a sponsor is looking for and what you need to think about when you're developing your sponsorship um, proposition. We'll then move on to building your prospect list. That's the fun bit. Uh, we'll look at a couple of case study examples, one that I've created, which is a uh, 18 to 24 ticket scheme. So I, you know, pretending I'm an organization and that's what I'm looking for sponsors for. Then we'll get onto outreach and approach. So new business emails, cold calls, et cetera. And then finally, we'll touch on cultivation and engagement. OK, so what does a sponsor look for? So I think we, again, have touched on all of this, but audience and engagement. So who is your audience? Do your audiences align with the brands that you're speaking to? Why would they be interested in, in your audiences? Are they looking to engage in that audience because they don't yet deal with them or, or sort of uh, cater to them? Uh, are they trying to reach a very specific audience, you know, Gen Z, millennials, boomers, et cetera? So bear in mind your audience and their engagement in your organization. Can the sponsor add value? So how can the sponsor add value to a partnership beyond the partnership fee? So how can you think about services, staff, expertise that can elevate your partnership? Um, particularly, I think this is more relevant now than ever before so that brands feel like they're really special, like that you're not just going out to hundreds, even if you are. I think it's about thinking about them uniquely and, and how they could add value aside from just sponsoring the program. And then reach and awareness. So can your marketing and comms support the scale quality needed for the sponsor? You might not be able to match their budgets in terms of what they spend, but what are your channels and how will they support the sponsorship? And then finally, are you a trusted organization with a positive and relevant image and reputation? Do you have similar brand values and alignment? You know, that's like super important at the moment and often a lot of what we're talking about. OK, and then just to see what we're thinking about when we're kind of considering our our sponsorship proposition. So your audience data and I'll go on to this slide in a minute, but ensure you have a robust and detailed information on your audiences so that you can talk confidently to confidently to a brand that you're approaching. They'll expect you to have all of that information. And I'll just quickly show you. So these are the types of things you want to be thinking about. So speak to your marketing and comms team, get your basic info, ages, gender, ethnicity, location, where your audiences are coming in from. Look at their lifestyle and their sort of spending habits. You know, you can do an audience segmentation, look at your various different stakeholders, levels of engagement. So your high net worth individuals, your corporates, um, your board of trustees, your development board. Look at your membership surveys. If you have a membership team, chat to them about it because they'll know a lot more. Your reach, your marketing reach versus your digital reach. Um, check in with all of those channels to make sure that you have all your stats up to date. Then look at your dwell times, you know, your footfall across the site. I imagine most of these organizations and all of you on your calls are in incredible locations. Just so thinking about all of the types of people that are walking through your building or past your building and also frequency of engagement. So um how often they're visiting the organization, how often are they buying tickets and things like that. Okay, so uh, the value. So once you've, you've got all your, your audience data, um, look at the value, and, uh, and this is sort of value and assets, but look at your tangible and intangible value of your assets to make sure it's reflected in the fee. Rebecca said this previously, but Corporate partnerships are not about funding your project. They're about paying for the rights. So make sure that you're costing up everything correctly. Your assets, make sure you're, you've, you've conducted a sort of robust analysis of your sponsorship benefits. You know, what does that look like? Event, exhibition, show, consider which benefits might appeal and have that like shopping list so that you can pull it out and talk to brands about what might be interesting to them, you know, tailoring the partnership. And then finally, case studies. It's always worth looking back at your previous partnerships that have been successful or those that have been challenging. Look at those successful activations. What's worked, what hasn't, you know, what has excited partners in the past? Um, 
bear all of that in mind when you're kind of working on your sponsorship proposition. So that's just a bit about the audience. Okay, so now for the fun bit. Um, you have your sponsorship proposition, you're ready to go, you know what the project, event, exhibition, production is. A good starting point and some, something that I do first is that I look at the top sponsorship categories. So I do take a look and do a bit of a peer review of other arts organisations just to see who's sponsoring what and the sectors, finance, uh, telecoms, um, lifestyle, etc. Just to give me a bit of a sense. Um, and particularly if you're really new to this, you know, uh, it's just great to look at what other organisations are doing. But also more widely than that, I look at... Um, sport entertainment uh we're quite a different um sort of we're quite a different sector to the sporting sector but I think you can take some takeaways from there and you can be quite inspired by some of the partnerships so I also look at what is going on in those big sporting partnerships Premier League uh women's football Wimbledon etc and then I also kind of look at some emerging sponsorship categories so more recently I think in the tech space cryptocurrency cryptocurrency exchanges, uh, AR, VR, popping up everywhere, sponsoring things. So also seeing where I think there could be kind of a bit of a disruptor in the field who might want to move into sponsoring something in the arts. Sort of beyond that, I then look at marketing trade press. So essentially websites like Campaign, The Drum, PR, Weekly. Uh, so I can look at what brands are doing what, what brand is launching a new product, what amazing campaign has just uh, you know, been shown on the tube or on trains. I'm always looking at kind of brands and their advertising. I mean, and you also don't have to look too far by just, you know, watching TV on Channel 4 and seeing the types of ads that are being targeted at you. And also um, just what brands are also sponsoring things on TV. So I'm always kind of taking a bit of inspiration um, there. So I always kind of have myself signed up to PR week, the drum campaign, as I mentioned, just so I can kind of get those notifications. Your CRM. So this is a really obvious one, but uh, obviously like use your database that you've had all your lovely warm conversations or partners previously so that you can kind of maybe re-engage with some of them. That project might not have worked, but what project um, that you're working on now might be a better fit. You know, it's always worth going back to a warm conversation than a completely cold one. So I know you can pull reports from your CRM databases as, you know, so who, who were your hot leads. So Again, great to go back and, and use that information, especially when it's already there. Um, and then finally, I wanted to, to label this my trusted Google spreadsheet, but I've renamed it as priorities. But essentially what I do when I've done this field of kind of research is I create a big Google spreadsheet and have in one column all of the brands. And in the next column, I sort of label it priorities slash the angle. Um, so because now I have a really clear understanding of the sponsorship proposition, I can kind of put next to it what angle I think will work best with that brand. So is there a similar audience fit or do I think that they're really interested in reaching this audience? Do they have budget? So I sometimes check the FTSE 100 just to see how those businesses are doing, but also LinkedIn and looking at the size of the company and, you know, checking Google News to see if there's any relevant information that can kind of help make that decision for you. So a little a little look yeah. at capacity around budgets. Also outside of London, so um, thinking of organisations that are outside of, of London, uh, big businesses in your area that are doing lots of advertising. So um, I also think of kind of national offices, so brands that may be based in London or businesses that are based in London and they have their regional offices so how can potentially my touring project hit all of those different offices and engage um, their clients or their workforce and then finally um, history of sponsorship so have they ever sponsored something before uh, do they have a long running history of always investing in the arts or are they new to it so just my kind of list of priorities um, against the brands that I'm thinking of approaching So here, I thought it might be useful just to kind of talk about um, an 18 to 24 ticket scheme. So um, I've created this 18 to 24 ticket scheme, which would include offers. My organization has just set it up. Um, 
it's uh yeah 10 pound tickets for for that age group um these are just a kind of snapshot of some of the brands that i would um go out to so i think tech might be a bit of an obvious one TikTok has always been targeting kind of younger audiences. Um, it's a bit of a creative community there. So how could they maybe support the that audience or, you know, could use them as focus groups, et cetera. eBay is a great example because they recently partnered with Love Island. Um, and I think actually have been partnering with them for the last two years. So automatically kind of targeting a younger audience. And then you have like the Depops, the Vintage, the kind of circular economy. I know that Gen Z are more consciously minded when it comes to fast fashion. Um, and then dating apps, um, finance. So those brands that I've included, Monzo, Starling, Revolut, Barclays, HSBC, some of those ones are disruptors. So how are they maybe trying to target those digitally savvy 18 to 24 year olds who are always on their phones? Telecoms, Voxy is an obvious one. That is a brand that purely targets younger audiences with its cheap mobile tariffs. I've got um, beauty and um, I did include a bit of apparel in this one because although Gen Z are a bit of a kind of fashion conscious audience, I still think they're into their trainers and things like that. But someone like Colt Beauty is a really interesting one because they don't exist in person. It's all online. So perhaps engaging with this audience in real life might be interesting to a brand like that. And then your Doves, your Lynxes, like I said, Nike, Adidas, they still feel like to me a really interesting brand fit. I've then got like travel and leisure. So that audience might have more available income to spend, gap year students looking to travel, young professionals with their first job and their first paycheck. So again, it might be a really interesting audience for that sector. And then finally, professional services. So the likes of Deloitte, Linklaters, PwC, those of which who are trying to um, recruit graduates um, into their organization. So targeting that kind of age group for recruitment but also engaging their younger workforce keeping them interested so um that's a bit of a snapshot of a kind of example ticket scheme and I think it's worth bearing in mind that for each of these there would be so many different ways in which these brands could get involved apart from just sponsoring it there's content there could be focus groups product launches events um brand activations on site with that engaged audience so that's just a bit of a, an idea um, of, of where you could go with that one. So here, I just thought it'd be useful to talk about some interesting partnerships that I've seen recently, some brand partnerships. So very quickly, Porsche and Punch Drunk, um, not one that I thought necessarily matched when I first saw it, but actually Punch Drunk tickets are quite expensive and people do travel outside of London to come down to a Punch Drunk show, you know, immerse themselves in that experience. So I think they have quite a national reach in terms of their audience. And when I read into it, the uh, partner partnership was all around unlocking um, like-minded visionaries. Uh, Porsche would like to immerse their audiences into the world of Punch Drunk. You know, there were offers to be chauffeur driven in a Porsche car to the Punch Drunk show and offers to drive a Porsche around a track. So I think that's quite an interesting one. And then Barclays Dance Pass, the 16 to 30 ticket scheme. I've worked on this myself, so I know how passionate Barclays are about um making sure that dance is accessible and bringing global or artists to Sadler's Well so that people can experience them dance like that. So that's just a great partnership that I specifically have worked on. And then Kick On and Starling Bank. So I think this is quite clever because it's jumping off the back of the Lionesses win. So Starling partnered with Gift of a Kit, a charity which was set up to get more women and girls playing football by um, supporting them with kit and footballs and resources etc so interesting because I think this is reaching a very female audience and then finally the Brit Awards and Mastercast and uh, Mastercard the partnership is all around nurturing the future of creative talent with the Brit School and um, the partnership supports like their talent de talent development uh, there's lots of lovely content it's a partnership that I think has been going for quite a long time um, and then it obviously culminates in the televised Brits on ITV which is sort of incredible in terms of you know brand and reach but you know at its core it's also about supporting future talent okay so now we have our prospect list and again please uh, apologize if this feels very basic and you know all of this but I'm just I'm starting at the very beginning but uh, once you have your prospect list ready, 
I think, and, and you need to kind of figure out who you're going to be approaching, a good starting point is to share that prospect list with your development board or your board of trustees, just to see where there might be a kind of a senior level connection, obviously, to have their influence decision making is amazing and it kind of really supports your supports your partnership to have kind of senior members involved so share that list with your your, your dev board and your your board of trustees to see if they know anyone and see how they can you know support you but also share it with your wider development team depending on who your individuals are and where they're you know who they work for there could be a way in so a bit of a kind of two three pronged attack might be great then if uh that's not an option. I go to LinkedIn and I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn finding the appropriate person to speak to. So heads of marketing, heads of sponsorship, heads of partnerships. When it comes to law firms and finance, I also look at like heads of client services or new business. So that's around client engagement. So just make sure when you're looking on LinkedIn, you're looking obviously at the role, but also their responsibilities because you can get a sense of, of what they do and if they're the right person for you. Um, I also on LinkedIn look at their posts that they've shared, any partnerships that they've done, things that I can like reference in my approach to them. So it makes it feel like uh, I really know them quite well and um, I really understand what they do in their business. Um, I've popped in finding email addresses because if you haven't perhaps got a CRM system or you haven't got a huge bank of contact details, then finding email addresses and contacts is quite easy. LinkedIn is great. Press releases are great in order to get kind of um, the email format so you can kind of work it out. Um, and also just on the company website. So if you're like totally starting from scratch or your CRM doesn't have this contact detail from this specific brand, have a search on Google. It's sort of your best friend. So my approach, uh, just before I email, I want to make sure that I gathered as much information about that brand and that person so that my email feels really bespoke and, and hopefully stands out amongst all of the other emails that they get. So as I mentioned earlier, I use trade press like Campaign, The Drum, PR Week, and also Google News just to see what their recent campaigns are, what the brand is doing, so I can reference that in the email. And also amazingly, sometimes the specific marketing director I'm speaking to will write a quote very specific to that campaign about how they want to get Gen Z interested in uh, the new mobile phone they're launching, etc. So I can sometimes use their specific quote in an email and say, you're doing this, we're doing this, let's work together and do this. It's just that you can always find some little gems in there. Um, I also uh, take a little look at sometimes if that specific person has a Twitter, I'll just have a little look at what they're posting. Again, it's like demonstrating that I know their world, I know their passion. Um, and then also I look at the social media of the brand. So looking at their tone of voice, Greg's has like an amazing um, tone of voice on social media as does like Innocent. So I think you can tell a lot by a brand looking through their social media and their marketing campaigns so that you can, you know, again, like I said, reference that in your email approach. OK, so a new business uh, email, as I call it, your, your first initial email. So your cold email, potentially. Um, these are just a couple of things that I think about and, and I've I've used them throughout my career and they were particularly useful when I worked in sales, which was very target driven and totally based on how many meetings you got and how many people you spoke to. So think about the tone of voice of your email. I imagine everyone on this call is su cool, is super creative and is working for a creative organization. So like, how can you inject a bit of that personality into your email so that it's not just, dear sir, madam, we do this. It would be lovely to meet. Let's do, you know, just, just think about how you can be a bit more interesting to like catch their attention. Like I said, these people receive so many emails. So how can you stand out? Flattery goes further than you think. Uh, I learned this a long time ago that if you compliment a marketing director or, a, you know, a partnership or sponsorship manager on work that they've done, they really like it. So if you're enabled, you know, if you're unable to kind of say that in an email somewhere, like that's really nice. And, and often people will be like, oh, thanks so much, you know, because they're obviously passionate about the work that they do. Don't just talk about yourself. I mean this in that I've done this lots of times. 
I'll write an email that I'll think is amazing because I'm talking about the exhibition I'm working on and the artists involved and how it's so different to anything we've done and that it's brave and bold and innovative. And I could go on and on about how amazing it is. And actually, I've not talked about them at all, not talked about why they might be interested in sponsoring, not talked about any ideas I might have for that brand. I've just kind of talked all about how wonderful I am. So this comes on to length. But if you can kind of think about how you can make your email sound a little bit like, hi, I saw you did this. It was really exciting. We're doing this. I think there's something there that we could do together. I've got some ideas, you know, so that it, it feels like there's a connection of and, you know, you're joining the dots. Um, a length of an email. So I don't think emails that are too long are often read. So how can you kind of be short, sharp and snappy um, and get everything into a shorter email? Maybe look at some emails that have worked in your inbox, you know, what worked, what didn't. I just often think people just don't have time to read really long emails. And even just looking at it, it might be like, oh, I'm going to park that for a while. So think about how you can maybe shorten them slightly. And then also subject lines. Just how, how, you know, what stands out in your own inbox? Um, how can you make that subject line really interesting and like, you know, get your organization's name in there straight away because I'm sure they'll want to read something from you rather than, I don't know, an offer on windows and doors or something, you know, just think about your subject lines and then um, an action. So at the end of the email, I always try to ask for a meeting in person or over Zoom. And I try and be a little bit cheeky, you know, I'd love to take you out for a coffee and a croissant. How are you free next Tuesday at 10 a.m.? It's super specific, but I think that's quite useful because it gives somebody the impetus that they have to reply back to something. Um, so I'd always leave with a bit of an action. As a follow-up to all of this, I tend to think about when I'm sending my emails. So is Monday morning a good time to send your kind of initial email approach? Probably not. Everyone's inboxes are usually quite full. Uh, so would Wednesday afternoon or Tuesday afternoon be better? I think Fridays are not bad. I think now people are sort of working from home. Um, that might be a good time. But just think about when your inbox is full and um, when their inbox might not be so full and vice versa. So you can kind of just map out when you want to schedule your emails. Um, as a chaser, I tend to leave it a week between sending my email approaches so that I'm not kind of bombarding them. But I'm also giving them enough time to perhaps they've missed my first email and they definitely want to read my second email. Um, and then finally, I put a photo of Dwight from the office. Uh, what a man, what a character. Uh, if you can and you feel brave enough, definitely pick up the phone. You might all be doing this anyway. So again, I'm sorry if I'm teaching you to suck lemons, as they say, but uh, pick up the phone and, 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 you know, be brave. We're all calling from really cool, lovely arts organizations and charities. So I think if you're polite and lovely and just say, you know, hi, I sent you an email last week. I think you might have missed it, but I'd love to talk to you about something. Is now a good time? And if they say yes, great. If they say no, then, you know, you can kind of um, you can kind of say no problem. I'll just drop you another email. But I do think it's really important. And it's something Rebecca and I are trying to do more and more, which is pick up the phone. They're usually in people's out of offices. So I always try and jot them down and keep them. Um, Ellie, I've got a few questions. Oh, uh, yes, I have been rambling, so. No, no not at all. Uh, so we've got three, which are all really similar, which is about using LinkedIn for approaches. So do you ever make an initial approach over LinkedIn? Uh, any view on LinkedIn as approaches? Um, uh, yeah, so uh, thoughts on messaging via LinkedIn. So I don't know what your thoughts are, Ellie. For me, um, I do definitely send people direct messages from LinkedIn yeah. if, I can't, if I can't find their email address. My experience is that the uh, response rate is lower than emails. I don't know what it is about LinkedIn. People seem very happy to ignore direct messages, I think potentially from people who they are not already contacts with. If it's someone that I have a, like if I'm already a first contact with, then I will get a response, but I find more often than not. So I'm on premium LinkedIn, which means I can message people once if they're not my contacts. But yeah, I would say the response rate is pretty low. What about you, Ellie? I'm the same. I, I don't know if I've ever sent an email to somebody apart from actually in a kind of work capacity of like, hi, would you like to go for coffee? I'd love to talk to you about my, you know, I actually haven't ever really used it on a new business approach. I just, I don't know. I, I it's just not, never something I've done. 
Um, but I would probably agree with Rebecca that I'm just not sure I find it the most effective. I use LinkedIn for everything else, finding people, looking at what jobs they do, but I'm not sure I think it's the most useful for a, a kind I'd, of... I'd, I'd say sort of last resort if you genuinely can't find anyone. So I have, yeah. I, I recently did email uh, a sunglasses brand um, that I'd seen in... Um, I think they were in Grazia and I just couldn't find their email anywhere on Google. So I sent and I did get a response and we did that. This, the partnership didn't land, but we did actually get emails and a meeting and, you know, proposals. So I did that. But that is, I'd say, the exception rather than the rule. The other place I really do find LinkedIn useful is if some of your contacts that you might have had from a while ago have moved jobs. Yeah. Um, you don't have their new email addresses, but you can see from LinkedIn that they've changed jobs. It's quite a useful place to go. Hey. I see you've moved jobs. What's your new email address? Just and the way uh, uh, Ellie and I often sweeten it is to say we really want to make sure you're still on our events lists because exactly. we, we and we'll come on to events later. But um, and actually, one thing I did think, which is sort of um, a good way of getting in touch, and I had some success from this because it actually led to a proposal, and we were going to we were actually going to partner with. Um, this brand but that came out of me emailing someone and saying hi I'm new to um, corporate funds raising in a sort of like cause based charity I'd love to just have a coffee with you because I see that you run this huge charity campaign and I'd just really love to learn a little bit more about it and she said oh okay I'll take you for a coffee and then I was you know I managed to tell her about what I was doing and then it led to you know a meeting so there could be something via LinkedIn like that when it's a bit more like I just want to understand you and your role that there could be something like that but that also just came from an from an email i hope that isn't too wordy shall i have a, a few other questions here as well um, yeah, yeah how bold or detailed should you be in your second email uh, any tips for that i assume that means a chaser email as opposed Excellent. to a response email yeah i wouldn't be too i'd also be a little bit short sharp and snappy with that so sometimes i've gone hey X. you might have seen my email below talking about this exciting project but again I probably wouldn't do a super long email um because you're just again adding to that kind of existing one so I do think being bold kind of do it I used to work with a guy years ago who would sometimes put subject lines in such as pizza on the fourth floor just so that somebody would open his email. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's a bit too much for me, but he said it had a, he said he used to get replies all the time. But I just think it's about seeing how you can inject your personality in that, that follow up email and just reference, just reference the email below and that you were like so keen to get back in touch and you were worried it might have slipped through the inbox. So you wanted to follow up again. Hope that answers that. Um, a couple of questions on um, regional museums and organizations. Yes and how uh do, is it worth approaching national companies i would say yes i don't know if anyone else has seen it but uh factory international have just announced aviva as their um title sponsor of the new the new factory international venue um which is really exciting so that is a regional organization who have gone to a big national company and got a huge successful uh sponsorship so if anyone on here from factory well done that's really thrilling thrilling partnership um uh, there's no question and we we talked about it in the last uh, the last presentation I think it's definitely more challenging if you're not based in London but that's not to say that national companies won't be interested if they are national rather than just purely London based yeah yeah totally I, I think I think there's loads of opportunity for outside of London regionally you know kind of talking about businesses in the area that would want to be supporting their local arts organization um and they have different budgets and different pots as well. But yeah, totally brands that are based in London would are still looking for that national presence. So and I think more so than ever before, actually. I think one of these questions, any tips for organizations that are national without a real regional home or venue? I think actually in some ways that's an easier sell than an organization who is only based in a regional venue. Um, so for example, we're we're running a big partnership uh, at the moment, which is completely national from a charity that don't really have any one one home and we do I think we mentioned last time we do a lot of work with Matthew Bourne and so some of our conversations are often around those sort of touring venues yeah um and then any success with a direct mail approach to prospects there's so much noise on email I don't know if a piece of mail will reach the relevant person I would say that's not something that we've done Ellie I can't think of any oh, I, only from when I worked in advertising people would do that uh but I also think it's really challenging because of the way we work now um, I guess 
I do know that when we worked on the Platinum part, Platinum Jubilee, um, there was very official letters went out from very senior people in the organisation to very senior people in corporates. Um, that is a, quite a specific example, you know, the Platinum Jubilee, and they were, you know, they sort of raised 12 million in um, about 18 months. It was amazing. And that, that was a very, very direct peer-to-peer -peer approach, as opposed to a sort of direct mail out to lots of potential um, sponsorship level managers. But I think if you can be creative with it and it might grab someone's attention, I'm a bit sort of like, why not? But it isn't something I have have necessarily done before. Um, sorry, quite should, should, you know, quite a lot of questions. Do you want to carry on, Ellie? And maybe I've only got one more slide, which is literally okay, around cultivation engagement events. So I'll just finishing on finish on that and I'll literally be like two, three minutes and we can get back to the questions. OK, so final slide. So, yes, yeah, so cultivation um, and events. So it's really important to look at your event strategy if you don't have one and what your organization is doing. So look across your year and pick out key moments, shows, exhibitions, um, programs, projects where you think there could be some corporate engagement. Um, and that will really help you to demonstrate to partners why they should come on board. And I would say also, like, look at the timings of your events, specifically with corporates, early morning, but lunchtime sessions, that's hard to go. And then obviously evenings works better for them after work. Um, but also work with your wider development team so that you can maximise your capacity and your budgets to put on these events and also include individuals and your board so that you can make your events really zhuzhy and, and lovely networking opportunity for your corporates to come and join and I know some organizations run purely corporate membership evenings only so it's a really lovely opportunity to kind of network with you know peer-to-peer -peer, so that's nice um but also uh always invite your creatives to your event so your chief execs your creative directors your heads of learning engagement your producers because Corporates will want to be in the room with those types of people. They want to be hearing the little, you know, kind of uh, little gems of what they're working on and what their process is. So always invite those guests into your events. And it also helps to ground your organization in the context to talk about the mission and the ethos. Um, we always sort of offer backstage tours or opportunities to have little in-person chats with our kind of creative team. So how can you maybe incorporate that into some of your events that might be interesting? Bringing in a model box, et cetera. They love that kind of stuff. Um, and then just in terms of how you potentially can meet brands and um, heads of marketing, I think sponsorship is uh, a really good example of how you can kind of go and attend their networking co conferences. And it's a great place to connect with brand managers, heads of marketing, heads of sponsorship. And there's also similar ones on campaign, the drum, they all run their own conferences. So it's also a good way to meet people. And then once you've met them, invite them to your events. In terms of actual outreach to events, we do use mail merges when it comes to inviting people, just get doing a big old outreach and getting people to the, to the event. And you can have a conversation that starts in September and they might not be interested in doing something to the following September. So just keep keep inviting them, keeping those sort of conversations moving and warm, you know, each time changing it up, getting them to be introduced to the creative director or the learning team if it's a specific um, project. So, yeah, I think that is everything. Yeah, yeah, that is the uh, end of the presentation. So very helpful, uh, you know, to kind of answer questions now. We've got a big list of... So, um, a coffee meeting with a new potential sponsor. Should you bring a handout presentation to take away in your experience? I, my experience is I wouldn't just because it would feel like you've already preempted what you think they're going to say or what they want. I think it's much better to, to say that you will follow up with something, having had the conversation, having thought very much. Otherwise, it doesn't feel like you're really interested in what they're interested in um yeah. I so would that agree. Would, do you agree with that Ellie I'd agree with that yeah because you can then you've got your shopping list of things you might want to talk to them about but you might have thought they were thinking of one thing and then you meet them and it totally changes direction so yeah just being open to whatever they're thinking and how you can best support them and help them I think that's also what a partnership is trying to do they've got objectives so how can you how can you support those objectives David's admitted to uh, ignoring DMs on LinkedIn. Tap, tap, <laughs> yeah. um, but no, I know what you mean. Uh, he says, especially ones that are not are generic. So I think that is a really key point for me. It needs to be 
there's no point in sending a generic email on LinkedIn, absolutely. But if there was something really specific that, as Ellie says, it's around, you know, I saw this or I've just noticed that you've done this brilliant thing or you've just posted this on LinkedIn and it feels like there's an interesting conversation that we could have about this, that potentially might cut through. But again, if you can email them, probably better. Yeah. Um, do you find timelines from outreach to project delivery need a certain amount of time for larger partnerships? Absolutely. I think we talked about this last week. Um, ideally, 18 months or longer. I think anything under a year is really hard because um, people are putting in their budget. So and they'll be annual. So you really want to be talking to someone who then is interested enough to think about budgeting you for the following year, which then could be an 18 month timeline. Um, so the longer you've got. And I think asking when their budgets get set so that you can kind of pop things like that in your calendar, like reminders to get back in touch because, you know, they might be reviewing partnerships. Any sort of information you can get is kind of golden. Uh, does GDPR make a direct difference to who and how you're able to co contact individuals working in business? Um, now I'm not going to pretend to be a GDPR expert, but my understanding is that uh, if emails are publicly available, um then that's fine um and if it's relevant then you should be able to contact people on email um for all of mine and ellie's emails we have a, a line at the bottom that allows people to say we're not interested please don't contact me again without having to get into any sort of discussion with us essentially an un unsubscribe even though our emails are mostly bespoke um that just allows people to kind of uh but as I say, I'm not an actual expert. <laughs> yeah, I did actually Google this before because I thought this might come up. And from what I read, it's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine. I'm sorry. Um, uh, from my reading of it, we can still continue. And I've never had anyone say, oh, my goodness, you haven't read the GDPR guidelines. You can't. Yeah, it's mostly people just opting out. So um, I think we're all we're all good to go. Um, preference for online face to face events post post pandemic. I presume I don't know whether that means meetings. Um, I'm finding it still quite challenging to get people to come have a coffee. I prefer to meet people to have a coffee to have a chat, but it's obviously much easier to put in a face, an online meeting. Um, in terms of events, absolutely back in real life. I don't think uh, online events are as far as I've seen happening anymore, people are not interested. We did have um, a breakfast event at the Young Vic the other day where we invited key donors to hear from um, the exec director and the artistic director about, and because of capacity, we did have an, a kind of online version where people could link in, but actually the, the numbers who joined online weren't high, but those who did join were quite pleased to have that option at 8.30 in the morning. So I think there's a bit of hybridness going on, but I think purely online, I feel like it's not happening anymore. Yeah. And if you haven't heard from someone who you've sent a, you know, a proposal to, then often a good way is just inviting them to an event because they'll reply. And then you can say, you know, there's a lot of people I've perhaps sent things to and they've never replied, but then I'll, they will reply to a, invite an invitation to an event. So, um, yeah, don't feel like your cause is lost there. The idea of contacting big brands feels quite intimidating and scary. Do they take notice of charities that aren't huge? Um, it is a challenge. We So Ellie and I currently, one of our clients is a very much a kind of mid-range charity, three and a half million a year. Um, so we do find that it's really hard to cut through compared to kind of the really big charities. But I think, but we but we have had success we, and we have had specifically corporate success. And it's about working out what it is that you can offer that some of the others can't. Now, generally, a smaller organisation can offer a sort of more bespoke. You're saying you'll make a much bigger difference to us than you would to a big play, a big organisation. But I think it's more that ROI, like what can you directly offer? So in a, for the charity that we work with, um, it's more often than not national reach because it's a charity that does have a, a genuinely national reach sort of across all four nations. So we find that a lot of our corporate partnerships are interested in that um, or are interested in very specifically our audiences and our beneficiaries. So really, if you really think about it, I would say Ellie and I are still slightly working to crack the charity of the year. Um, yeah. Area because of we've not quite done it with this charity and it's the, it's probably the our only client at the moment who would sit within that. But I think most of the organisations on this call are um, probably not uh, are arts organisations rather than those sort of charities. But there is a few who will do that. Um, do you have any advice for small teams that have minimal capacity to dedicate to corporate prospecting? It's something that always gets pushed at the back of the to do list. Yeah, and that it is really hard, but it is so crucial to have a strong pipeline. You sort of 
and it's so easy to do. So I completely understand that you can kind of get stuck in looking after your current partners and your corporate members. But if some of those partnerships are running out, then you need to have like a really strong pipeline of new business. So even if you send one, you know, set some targets, not like um, hard targets, but, you know, sort of set yourself a weekly. I'm going to send a new business email a day. And I'm going to just do this for a month. And each person in the team is just going to send one a day. They're going to choose which one. They're going to really think about how bespoke that email is. And just see, you know, what you get from that. Because also it's a little bit of a kind of getting into that mindset. Even now I'm sometimes, I see a big list and I'm like, oh, where do I start? And Rebecca and I will split it up. And we will start with the ones that we feel we have a stronger connection to. And then we'll kind of go from there and we'll we'll regroup. So I think maybe setting some little mini targets within the team just to try and get that confidence up in, in doing it. Um, and, even, and maybe even setting some time and then you can schedule your emails so that they kind of go out on a day that you choose, you know, scheduling them on a Monday for them to go out on a Thursday. Um, but talk about what's best for the team, because I am conscious that all of this that I talked about, there is quite a lot of work to do, but I think you get more you just get better and quicker at doing it and knowing where to go to find some information and pulling it out and identifying a little gem that you can reference in an email. Um, that would be my advice. Yeah, I think you're right there, Ellie. Like I find I do quite a lot of my new biz stuff on a Friday afternoon when stuff's quieter and I'm just sort of sat and I've got less sort of traffic, sort of reactive traffic coming into my inbox. But then I set them to send. They just sit in my drafts and on a sort of Tuesday sort of late morning I'll just ping those all out um, yeah. and it means I've kind of done that for the week and um, the other thing that's probably worth doing is if you can dedicate some time to developing your, a really solid prospect list then just make sure that they're always on your en events invites because that's something that doesn't need quite so much detailed work around kind of developing that ask and looking at what that email is um, and actually if you could just keep on doing it because there's nothing better than having someone come into your building or come into an event or see your work to, to begin that conversation so if you can just sort of add in those that prospect list into and I really the other thing I'd say on events is I wouldn't worry too much about numbers we sometimes will have a prospect list of say 200 for an arts organization that will want to invite to one of their patrons events say and there'll be a nervousness from the organization thinking oh my god I will never be able to cope with that many people the numbers of people that actually attend is always really small. I think you're looking, you know, if you get 5% of those 200 people saying they, they want to come, then that is brilliant and probably about where we where it kind of sits. And even if you have two people come along, that's two conversations that you can start and they've proved an interest in the organisation. So that's another way of just without spending too much time on corporates, knowing that they can keep on sort of having those touch points, even if they can't come along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Charlotte, would you advise running an event specifically to cultivate new corporate members, for those who you probably haven't spoken to yet about a specific partnership, about, about a specific partnership to gauge early interest? So, yeah, back to that point. I, I and as Ellie said, I wouldn't run just an event for cultivation. I would tag on to other events that you're running, press nights if you've got enough tickets, patrons nights, something else that you're already doing because you're never going to get huge numbers. And it means they come along, it's buzzy, they meet the board, there's probably other people there, there's existing partners there um, to talk to. I think running something that's purely for like purely for cultivation um, costs extra money and resources. So try and tag on. But yeah, in terms of just getting people along as a cold intro to your organisation, absolutely, it's definitely a way to start a conversation. And we've had people who have come along to events and then become members or joined up two years later, you know, and it, and it can be a slow burn, you know, but it's but it's always just worth keeping on them on those lists. Have you anything more to add on that, Ellie? No, exactly. All, all agreed. Yeah. Ah, yes. So um, we had this um, question uh, right at the top about the audience agency data. And I'm basically going to open it up That's to the audience. Uh, how do I put in a question? Uh, I don't know how I do a question. Can you go to the chat and you write Put it in the chat and um, then it goes to everyone? Yeah. So it's basically saying as um, the value of audience agency data, as ACE won't be working with the audience agency from the summer, I wondered how other organisations would be gathering this kind of information. Obviously, Ellie and I don't work in-house for any organisations. So this is something that I think I probably was unaware of. And we would just talk to marketing teams at uh, organisations or kind of use existing data. But yeah. if anyone else um, has thoughts on that, please do put them in the chat. So um, the anonymous person who asked that question uh, gets some answers. Um, right. Otherwise, I'm trying to think if we've missed anything. 
Uh, one thing I didn't, um, just on the event side of things, which is probably again obvious, but get your development board to bring some guests along, maybe from the corporate sector, and then, you know, mingling, use use your dev board and your board of trustees as much as possible. Um, I know I've sort of said that, but specifically with uh, events, see who their network is, who they potentially know and how you can get some of those guests in because they could then turn into corporate members or potential sponsors down the line. Yeah, and I think it's always good with development boards and boards to kind of have something proactive that they can do. That's not just can you just link me in with your contact? Um, so, yeah, I agree. Uh are you finding corporate budgets tighter than pre-pandemic? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Tighter, like much harder to get over the line. We talked last time about ROI being so much more important and kind of, you know, we're, we've definitely had Ellie and I, I'd say, several conversations over the last year where it felt very exciting and really like an absolute brilliant link. The partnership felt really exciting. Um, you know, in historically would have gone, well, this feels like it's kind of going to get over the line and they've not. And I think it's because either marketing budgets have been pulled or they've gone, they've moved the marketing budget over to something much clearer, like advertising or kind of more traditional marketing pieces. I do think specifically sponsorship budgets are being really pulled. Yeah. And the other challenge, I think, is people are creating their own sort of brand partnership stuff kind of from grassroots upwards so you're like working with agencies um rather than thinking we're well, working with an arts organization on their existing stuff so i think what we're trying to do is position our organizations as a platform which they can create something very bespoke within rather than saying sponsor this or be a corporate member here um so it's it's so for example the partnership that we're working on with the reading agency at the moment which is being announced tomorrow so I can't mention it but with an apparel brand we essentially went to them to talk to them about an existing campaign they are already working on and offered the reading agency as a platform to amplify an existing campaign and that's how that's come through I don't think they would have come just directly to us if we'd said do you want to sponsor our project yeah. Um, in the end it sort of worked out the same way they are essentially as far as we're concerned sponsoring our projects but for them it's essentially they're using it as a platform so just kind of slightly tweaking your approach on that yeah um okay where are we at 52 um david i don't know if you want to jump online now and have a little chat about some of the raised stuff and then if anyone else wants to add into the audience ag agency question or has any other questions yeah there might be sort of time for a few more yeah, firstly, um, huge thank you to both of you for sharing so much. And I think a really helpful guide of taking people through step by step how to find those prospects and how to make uh, make contact. I was just having a look actually on the audience agency stuff because, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people know, when Arts Council stopped working with the audience agency or said they're going to stop working, they've appointed PwC to put something else in place, but that has been delayed. But audience agency have said they're going to continue providing support, albeit not as an MPO. So hopefully some of that data will still be there in in some guys and as and when PwC get their um, stuff in place, which it sounds like reading through the not subtle press release from audience agency is going to be quite similar to what they've had in place over um, the last five or six years. Um, but as I say, no, massive thank you, not just for today, but for the sessions you've done over the last couple of weeks as well. So this is the final part of our sort of deep dive into all things corporates and cultural organisations. Um, so I, I'm sure everyone's taken a huge amount away from, from these three sessions. So thank you for sharing so much and for giving that insight into how you're putting this into practice on a daily basis with your clients and the organisations uh, you're working with. We are hoping now to run another mini series which will look at various aspects of using digital technology and digital channels in fundraising uh, and the first one of those will be a session with give a little looking at how you can maximize income from uh, contactless donation platforms uh, so give a little are a service provider and they work they're going to bring i think uh, one or two of their clients to talk about how they've been implementing that technology 
within their organizations to try and increase the amount we can raise through contactless uh, gifts. That's going to be at midday on the 18th of July, and I will pop a link to that in the chat in, in just a second. A couple of other announcements about the uh, corporate, uh, so the cultural sector network and, and the RAISE program. I've mentioned over the last couple of weeks, uh, we're accepting applications for this year's mentoring program, uh, but the deadline is fast approaching. You've only got till Sunday, that's the 25th of June, uh, to get your application in. So if you're in the first five years of your fundraising career and think you'd benefit from, from having mentoring support over the next year, please do check that out. Please do apply. Um, and again, we'll put the link uh, for that in the chat. And there will be an evaluation form, I'm sure, as, as well. Um, people have asked for slides. All of these three sessions will be available. Uh, you can watch back the recordings of these on our LinkedIn page. Uh, so make sure you're part of the community over there and you'll be able to see when the sessions from this series and the previous series on individual giving um, get put up there. I think some of those sessions are, are already up there. So if there are things or if you want to share it with colleagues who couldn't join us today, that's the place to go to check uh, to check that out. Thank you to Rose who's put, putting those links in the chat. Uh, and a massive thanks to Rose anyway for all of her work behind the scenes in making this happen. And thank you to the Arts Council who have uh, supported all of uh, this series and, and the last series. Uh, final call out as well. The Cultural Sector Network relies on volunteers to put on events both online and hopefully in the next couple of months going back into the real world as well. We always need more people who can take part. So if you're interested in uh, supporting other cultural fundraisers uh, and trying to boost the professionalism of, of cultural fundraising in the UK and have got a bit of time to spare to help us with that, we'd love to hear from you. We're looking for people to help us put on events, to help with mentoring, uh, to help engage with other aspects of the Chartered Institute of Fundraising as well and make sure that the arts and cultural sector is represented there. Um, so if that would be of interest, please uh, do get in touch. Again, I'll put my email address in, in the chat. Did we have any other questions come in while I've been rambling through all of that? I don't think so. Uh, no, I don't think so. No. Brilliant. Well, in that case, one final thank you to Ellie and Rebecca for all of their time and effort over the last three sessions. And yeah, do hopefully join us for the digital fundraising sessions as we start to announce those, starting with the Give a Little contactless donation session on the 18th of July. Thanks all. Have Thanks. A good Bye. Bye.